These are 20 lessons from the book, The Four Hour Work Week, that really helped me leave my nine to five when I was 24. And hopefully uh, some of these tips can, can help you guys out as well. Retirement is actually the worst case scenario. Retirement as a goal or a final destination is kind of flawed. When we think of retirement, we usually think of once you're 65, you're able to leave your job and kind of enjoy the fruits of your labor. Or even if you're part of the fire movement and you're looking to retire in your 30s or 40s, you're still kind of leaving everything behind. And this shouldn't be the way we look at retirement. First of all, this mindset would mean that you don't really enjoy the thing that you're doing for the main part of every day for the best years of your life. And that's just not really an option we should have. On top of that, if you are someone who has saved up enough money to leave their job early and retire early or even at the end of your life, eventually you're going to get pretty bored. There's a stat that you're a lot likely here to die once you leave your job. And if you're a very motivated person, within like a couple weeks, you're going to be like chewing your fingernails off out of boredom. So retirement as this big end goal shouldn't actually be the big end goal. Most people will choose unhappiness over uncertainty. This is something that I've just seen so much and I've definitely felt that myself when there's anything new or different, we often choose the, the safe thing to do, even if we know that that doesn't make us happy and it's not what we want to do for the next 5, 10, 20, 30 years. But instead we choose that over taking a risk and stepping out into the unknown. Which actually leads into the next point that risks are not as scary once you actually take them. A lot of people get stuck in their jobs or ruts or relationships because again, they're scared of taking risks and stepping outside of their comfort zone. It's much easier to move from one job to a very similar job or to go back to school or to just stay in the same relationship. But it's a lot harder to do something different, to start a business, to travel, to take a lot of uh, ownership over your life. And because of that, a lot of people never take that first step. I remember when I first left my job or when I first uh, was gonna buy a rental or when I first <laughs> posted myself as like some, some bumbling person who had terrible audio and had no idea how uh, to edit or anything onto YouTube that my friends and family were watching. All of those seemed super scary, but it was mostly the lead up to them that was scary. Once I actually did them, they, they weren't that bad. But for the most part, it's just in our heads. It's not actually doing it that's that scary. It's not giving up to put your life on pause. This was honestly one of the main factors when I was considering leaving my job and I was looking at different options. And it was this idea that it's okay to put your life on pause and try something else. Like worse comes to worse. If I had left my day job, I tried YouTube, it didn't work out. I tried some other things, those didn't work out. I could go back to relatively exactly where I was. Like I wasn't making a ton of money, so I could probably go somewhere else and not make a ton of money. Or even if you do earn a decent amount of money and you take six months or a year and you travel the world or do whatever you want to do or focus on something new, try to start a business. For most people, as long as they plan financially ahead of time, they can go back to relatively the exact same place they were before. Plus, they will most likely have been changed by those life experiences. Rehearse poverty regularly. Tim talks about this idea of restricting even moderate spending for one to two weeks and giving away maybe 20% of the clothes that you don't wear that often, which for most people is like 80% of their wardrobe and seeing what it's like to have the bare essentials and realizing that you can still be happy. And this is kind of like his idea of fear setting where you look at what is the absolute worst case scenario if I take one of these chances, if I take a risk, if this doesn't work out, it would be living like this in, in relative uh, poverty temporarily. But if you're a hard worker, you know that you can get out of that eventually and it's not actually all that bad. When I look back and when most people look back, it's when they were just barely struggling to get by. I remember we were living on like a, a, an insanely small amount of money, having the cheapest food possible. Uh, everything was really cheap when I was first getting started at my first uh, multifamily and I had spent everything I had on that investment. I, that, that was an extremely fun and, and exciting and happy time, even though I didn't have a lot of stuff. So see what it's like for a week and you realize that the worst case scenario isn't really that bad. The opposite of happiness is not unhappiness, it is boredom. Tim talks about this idea of excitement being what is, is closest tied to happiness. When you're going out and you're doing things that are fulfilling and exciting and experiencing new things, 
That's what a lot of us should be chasing. So if you don't really know what to do in life, instead of asking, what do I want to do? Or what should my goal be? We should be asking, what excites me? Is it reaching half a million subscribers by the end of the year so that I can give away $10,000 in a video? Because I think that would be super exciting, but it only happens if I get there by the end of the year. Or is it finding a way to travel the world and you can just work a few hours a day on your laptop or, or maybe not even work at all, but you get to experience new things and new cultures? Is it being an author and sharing that story that's kind of inside of you? Is it spending time with your kids? Like, what is it that excites you and how can you you get closer to that and in today's world when there's so many different ways to do things it, it, it's more possible than ever like it takes a lot of work but honestly it, it, it's so worth it and so fun to do something that you love every single day because you love to do it not because somebody's making you do it like I, I feel so fortunate I get to do what I'm what I'm doing here but that's that's not really the point anyways moving on make a dream line. If you guys want to do this yourself, I'll leave a link down in the description to like a worksheet that you can just download. I've done this a bunch of times and it, it's really exciting and kind of life changing. You start off with listing three to five things that you want to have, that you want to be, and that you want to do. And then you calculate the monthly cost associated with each one of those. And a lot of the times, most or all of those will be close to free or be relatively uh, cheaper, a lot cheaper than we think they are. You do this in a six or 12 month time span. Then you ask what the next step is and you do something every day to get closer to that next step. And he talks about doing this in a six month or 12 month timeline, not in like a five year timeline because then it's a lot easier to push things down the road. I love having like three month timelines for any uh, goal that I'm trying to accomplish because then it, it, it's something that I need to get started on right now that puts that sense of urgency there to make a big change in your life, to have, do, or be these things that you, you really want and would really change your life. So try Dreamline. It's a lot of fun. Being busy is actually a form of laziness. I know that I do this myself all the time. It's when I have a few things that are super important to do, I will put off doing them for the sake of like doing anything else. Honestly, I'll procrastinate, I'll be nervous. And a lot of times it's because those things that are really important are also the things that you can publicly fail or succeed on. And therefore we are scared of taking that risk of actually taking action on them. Like before I shoot a video, I procrastinated for like an hour before shooting this today, because if I don't do a great job, this video won't do well. People could make fun of me. I'm putting my own opinion out there. I'm talking about somebody who's somewhat controversial and I'm like wicked introverted. So uh, there's that as well. So instead we get busy with checking email all the time. We waste time on our phones, scrolling through Instagram, watching YouTube, binge watching friends again, listening to music or a podcast. We'll do anything else besides those important things. And oftentimes in today's society, we take busyness as like a sign of pride. When people ask you how you're doing, you're like, oh, I'm busy, work's crazy, this is nuts right now. And it shouldn't be a sense of pride. And when you're taking it as a badge of honor, it generally means that you're not prioritizing your time. And we're gonna get into how to get rid of all that uh, in the next couple of points. 80, 20, your life. I try to do this once a week or at least once a month, use the Pareto principle and ask myself what 20% of the effort is leading to 80% of the results or what 20% of the activities are leading to 80% uh, of my problems or my stress. And you can ask this question in almost every area of your life. What 20% of actions make you 80% of the money? What 20% of people give you 80% of the stress? And when you ask yourself this question, in, in literally every area of your life, you realize what those priorities are and you have to ruthlessly and, and really, uh, it takes a lot of effort to try to figure out how to cut out all those other things. But if you can cut those out, you have so much more time. Like this applies to so many things, even clothes. Most people wear 20% of their clothes 80% of the time. That's why I pared down my wardrobe so much and now I like I only have cuts because they just fit really well and I like to wear them all the time. Uh, not a sponsor, but there is a there's an affiliate link down in the description if you guys want to check them out. But honestly, this just applies to so many different things in life. Use Parkinson's law. This law states that work will fill the time that is allotted to it. Uh, and if you look at this in your own life, it, it's definitely true. I know it's true for me. If I have a week to get a project done, it'll take me a, a week. If I have a day, it'll take me a day. If I have two hours, I'll somehow figure out how to 
do it in two hours. Whether it's cleaning my house or, or making a video or writing a paper, whatever it is, if you set yourself a very firm deadline, you will figure out how to do it in that amount of time. But a lot of times we don't set deadlines and therefore all this work just clutters up and fills up our lives. So if you can set some very firm deadlines, your work will just magically take a, a, a lot less time because you'll figure out how to do it quicker. All right, put this on your calendar. Am I being productive or just active? And so many times I am just checking email again. I'm researching something that doesn't need to be researched. I'm working on something that's a month away instead of the things that I should be doing right now. So just every day, throw that on your calendar and you'll be shocked at how many times that will pop up and you're just like, you know what? I I'm not actually being productive right now. I'm just kind of like filling time. It really helps. Be dumb. This might not ha have been uh, the, the best title for this point, but it's this idea of kind of selective ignorance. Uh, especially I do this with the news at most types uh, of politics, anything that's going on in the world, my kind of philosophy is if it's newsworthy, it probably won't affect me because it's, it's, it's newsworthy anyways. Just stop watching, listening and, and reading the news, having it be something that you check out for an hour as soon as you wake up and then you listen to it on the car ride and then you talk about it with your friends, you go on a bunch of different websites, you listen to podcasts about it, you get home, you watch the news again. Generally, it will add absolutely nothing to your life and will add a, a lot of stress to your life, which actually it, it will most likely make you sick and has a, a bunch of other different uh, negative health implications, all from something that it doesn't matter really whether you know that it exists or not. If you do have a problem with this, you can always ask a friend or a family member. I have a few people who I ask like once a week or once a month, like, hey, did World War III happen or is anything I should know about going on? Cause like, I don't know what's up. And they'll tell you everything you need to know in like 10 minutes and you'll just save like a bunch of time, stress and, and headache and you won't have to worry about all this crazy stuff that's going on because it, it doesn't really affect you and you have to choose what you have your attention on. Is it bettering your life or is it just keeping up with everything that's going on with, with everything? Batch your emails. There are so many different productivity tips in this book. Uh, I could talk about any of these points for like 20 minutes each, but we have to narrow it down. So one of the best ones is to stop checking email all the time. The average person checks email about 15 times a day. Uh, and I think for most people, it is much higher than that. And actually checking your email it is kind of like, uh, you know, those one armed bandits, those lottery machines where you're like, you pull the thing down and like spins and you see is there anything new? Is there anything important? You get a little dopamine high out of that. It's kind of the same thing with checking the news, checking Instagram. You see, is there anything new? And your brain kind of likes that. But instead of doing this constantly and always getting distracted because you work for 15 minutes, you check your email, something comes up, you stop what you're doing, you, you put out that fire and then you come back and then uh, you get another email and now you're thinking about something else and you can't actually be all that productive. You can't get into flow states where you get a lot of stuff done. You're really enjoying your work because you're constantly being taken out of that state by checking email. So instead schedule three to four blocks throughout the day that you can check that email. He talks about getting it down to maybe once a week. Uh, that's not gonna work for everybody, but see if you can get it down to a few times a day where you can batch, get everything answered at once, once in the morning, afternoon and evening, and then you don't think about it the rest of the time. Like don't open stuff on Friday night that you can't deal with till Monday and it ruins your whole weekend when there, there's, there's nothing you can do about it. So just don't check it. Fake a phone call. This is another one of my favorite hacks. I used this for a while when I was uh, in management before I left my job. And that would be to answer the phone or when you have somebody come over to your desk or somebody stops by your house or whatever it is, you can use this a bunch of different ways, is to answer and say like, hey, I'm right in the middle of something. How can I help you? And they're gonna most likely be like, oh, I, I can call back another time or I can stop by another time. And you'd be like, no, 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 I got a minute, what's up? And they'll most likely tell you what they would have taken 20 minutes to tell you in under a minute. Or if they're rambling on and on, you'd be like, sorry, I have to get back to this. Can you send me an email about this? And they'll either not send you an email and it'll just go away, or they will send you an email and you can answer it in 30 seconds instead of again, taking 20 minutes. I use this all the time. It's amazing, especially for phone calls where you don't wanna spend an hour on the phone, but you wanna get this taken care of. Super helpful, just try it out. Outsource everything that, that you can. A lot of times we don't value our time and we don't think that we can or should or deserve to outsource 
uh, stuff, but it's something that I started doing recently that is super fun and it saves me time and money, which is kind of weird. He recommends taking five non-work related activities and seeing if you can outsource them just maybe for a week or a month just to see how it feels. Maybe it's cleaning. We hired someone to deep clean our house once a month. Maybe it's your lawn care or your laundry or cooking. All of these things you can find creative ways to get done relatively cheaply. And if you can save 10 hours a week by outsourcing things and the amount of money it costs you can earn in maybe two hours, then you're buying back and adding like a full day to your week by outsourcing these things and just working a few hours extra. And that's definitely valuable. It's worth something. So see what things in your life that you can outsource. It's honestly a lot of fun. You can do this in your work life uh, as well. It doesn't work for everybody, but if you can find things to outsource in your work life and maybe you make $50 an hour and you pay somebody $20 an hour, then you can actually in essence earn more money for working less. Anyways, just try to outsource anything that you can. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to subscribe and I'll see you next week.